I'm Mark Power, I'm from HPCC. I do apologise in advance for not using the HHC official branding, but I have to give this presentation next week uh, at HPCC 2023 in London. So, um, so it has neither the branding for today or Saturday. So anyway, um, I'm going to talk a bit about environmental sensing on everybody's favourite calculator. Uh, uh, oh, was it? Oh, you've got one. Whoa, okay. Uh, Gunter has lent me two, so he is clearly a huge fan of the, uh, the HP Prime. Um, anybody else? Oh, I have one, but I didn't bring it. Yeah, oh, oh, there's one down there. G2s? G2s? Okay, good. Right, you guys might be my target uh, market uh, shortly. Okay, so um, just as a, if you've been uh, a, a bit of recognition, some of this material, some of the code is based on some code that was print, push, published on the HP Museum site by somebody who, I don't know the name, um, and when I pointed out that the solution was incomplete, I got, well, I, I'm not giving you the code, which I thought was very unusual for a member of our community, but so there, there's perhaps some commercial reason. So I've used some of their code and then I've augmented it, so just as a warning. You may be aware that uh, one of the recent HP Prime versions of firmware includes USB commands. So you can open a connection, uh, and uh, if you just don't specify any parameters, the, command, the USB open command will return a list of connected uh, USB devices, and in this case, I'm looking at USB HID class devices, so they're human interface devices. And that includes things like mice and keyboards and stuff like that. Um, if you specify USB open with a uh, device ID um, and a PID, uh, then it will return a list of the input and output report lengths that you can use to communicate with that USB device. You can use send, sending a packet of USB data, and you can use re receive to ret retrieve, re uh, receive a list of data items. So, so far, so good. This, um, I only have a revision A, G1, and a G2, and this does not work on a revision A. Yeah, so uh, it'd be interesting if anybody's got a, a B or a C. No, one of those is missing. There's no B, a C or a D. Uh, to see if this works on those. Uh, so if, any, some, if anybody's got one of those handy, we'll give it a go afterwards. So um, what I want to do is use the HP Prime over, using USB to talk to I2C. So uh, has anybody come across I2C? I was looking through our old material. You've used, you, have you used this? Yeah, some of this? I2C. Sorry? What's I2C? I2C. So it's, it's um, well, is it described as, it, it's, um, Serial protocol, it, it's described as two wire, is it? Is that right? But it's really four wire because you've got plus ground and data and a clock, okay? Uh, I think it was invented by Philips. It's been around for years. Uh, Tony Jewell tried to sell the idea of an I2C interface on the HP 48 to HP in 2002 at the conference, I think, maybe? Um, so, and anyway, there were no takers, I think possibly because they were um, distracted by the French team and the meta kernel and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, if we, uh, we can use the default I2C configuration if we uh, have this FT260 USB HID device. It provides ports that uh, give I2C and UART, and it looks... Uh, It's the little blue board at the top of this. So the little, the little board at the top, the little board at the top is, has got an FT260 in the middle of it. All of the rest of it are pull-up things, jumpers, uh, and exposing the connections on that chip because, as you can see, it's pretty tiny. It's designed for uh, putting into mobile phones or game controllers, keyboards, things like that, mice. Um, so. Um, it's, it's just the little chip in the middle and everything else is just um, to make it easy to connect to. So I've got an evaluation board. So it's an evaluation board. Uh, it's quite a cheap device. 
It's uh, the FT260 EV1. You can buy that in the US for about $15 and about £12 in the UK. So it's not, it's not hugely expensive. There are some weird things with it though. The firmware on the Prime currently does not support certain USB commands. So you can use the default configuration as it is, but you can't change some of the parameters. So the default config for the UART for proper serial interface is 19.2, no stop bits, eight, eight, eight bits, one stop bit, yeah? So um, you could use it to talk to an HP50G uh, 49? Does a 49 do 19.2? I can't remember. You, you definitely can't talk to a 48, yeah, in the default configuration. So there's a bit of an issue around that. But it, it's an inexpensive device. Once you've got that device, what do you want to do with it? Well, we, this is about environmental sensing. So there is a device called the Bosch BME 680, uh, and that is a little uh, device which uh, have it a uh, tiny little thing on here. The chip measures three millimeters by three millimeters by 0.9 of a millimeter. I cannot solder that well, so I've got it on an evaluation board. Uh, again, relatively inexpensive, uh, 16 pounds in the UK, 21 dollars in the US. It measures, it, its applications are that it measures temperature, barometric pressure, humidity, and uh, air resistance, which is a bit weird, mm. but air resistance is a proxy for air quality. Yeah, it just happens to come out in kilo ohms as a measurement. So, um, its uses Bosch su suggest include air quality monitoring, weather forecasting, temperature, humidity alerts, that sort of stuff. Uh, and the size of the chip, you could build that into, say, a cell phone, and then you could tell whether it's been dunked in water, perhaps, or you know, something along those lines. Um, it is tiny. The manual for this is 53 pages, uh, including pseudocode and uh, the registers. So it has uh, a 256 byte memory map uh, split up into registers. And if you look at the Bosch documentation, there's pseudocode. So I went and implemented the pseudocode as per the Bosch document, and absolutely nothing worked. It was giving me total garbage. Uh, so then I thought, right, well, I'll have a look at the GitHub repository, which has got sample C code in, and that shows that the manual is incomplete because the manual totally fails to specify that some of the integers are signed and some of them are unsigned. So uh, that was a bit of a challenge. So my next job was to produce Mark's memory map of the chip, and on here you can't see because it's too tiny, uh, there are a huge number of parameters. So a whole load of these down here for uh, humidity uh, and pressure in here uh, and the others wherever they've gone to uh, uh, are parameters that have been set on the production line when Bosch calibrated the sensor. So in order to use the sensor, you have to read some of these from the chip and then you use those to set some of the parameters. You set the parameters, you perform a reading um, by reading the, the values back and hopefully you get the right values. So eventually after, how long have I been doing this? I think a year on and off as a spare time thing, uh, I've actually managed to get it to produce uh, the right information. So connecting this, BME 680, there's, there's the chip over there, it, it's absolutely minuscule. So it's got the four wires, look, we've got positive voltage, ground, and we've got the data and the clock. So just four wires to connect, and up at the top, the silver bit that's sort of a bit washed out, that is the micro USB. So you need a uh, OTG micro USB to micro USB. It's what came with the revision A of the Prime, but I, I think they stopped supplying it. That was for prime-to-prime -prime communication. So you connect up the four wires. There are no jumper changes required. And with the default jumpers on this, this is bus powered off the prime. Uh, so which we'll come to next. So I built the software for this based on some code that was on the Museum of HP calculators 
web page, the URL's there, and then I modified it based on the Bosch GitHub code to actually make the thing work. And what I've got is I've got a, uh, a little program, so I have a GUI which shows auto-scaled graphs in real time. Uh, you, the keyboard is active while it's running. You press and hold so that at the next refresh point, the key is detected. And you can speed up and slow down the sampling period. Uh, you can drop it into debug, which I need to do occasionally. You can uh, press exit to exit it. And when you exit it, it returns a matrix, which you can put in the spreadsheet application or you can send to your PC. And then you can, uh, and that includes the timestamps and the detailed uh, measurements, and then you can perform additional analysis on them. Uh, I, to, to that, I added a results uh, program, and that takes the matrix and shows you the graphs. So you can go back and you can review the graphs at a later point. There's also a terminal option which just shows it on the, uh, the HP Primes terminal. Now, um, you can see it working there. Uh, Hopefully, let's have a look. This is going to get tricky because I'm going to hold four things in my hands at the same time now. So the sensor's, oh, the sensor's running, and you should be able to see the temperature in, in the room there. It takes a little while for the measurements to settle, uh, but we've got a barometric pressure of about 1,008 and a point five, maybe, four. Um, we've got a temperature of about 23 degrees C. I do apologize, it occurred to me on the plane, you wouldn't have a clue what I'm talking about at this point, would you? <laughs> oh good, Niels, yeah, yeah. Well, the Europeans, we're all good on this stuff. Um, we've got the relative humidity on there, so that's settled itself down, that's probably because my sweaty hands were uh, too close to the sensor. So we're on about 58% uh, relative humidity, and we've got gas resistance uh, which, th this one seems to move about a lot, but it's, it's around the 270k ohm. A higher number is better. What's the gas resistance? It, it, what it is, the, there is a heater element, and, uh, and, and the sensor measures the resistance over a piece of metal in front of the heater, and that's proxy for indoor air quality. Um, so, uh, yeah. Oh, well, I'm going to do something worse than that. Even better, even better. Yeah. Whoa, um, whoa, whoa, whoa. But <laughs> do, do you mind how long this takes? <laughs> could, could somebody hold the mic for me? Thank you. Yeah, do you want to sit down there? Thank you. So, uh, okay, so we've got it as it is now. Now, let's ask Gene if he will just blow... Uh, on, onto this little device. Go on, go on. Breathe heavily. Now we should see. Yeah, humidity went up. Way up. Temperature went up. Humidity went up. Gas resistance went down, which is the air quality. Barome barometric pressure. Barometric pressure, you can see, stayed the same. Humidity is going down again. Yeah. So that so that will recover because you, because you've stopped. So, so this is measuring at, well, I've got a delay of one second between each. How long? Sorry? One, one second, I've got it set up, and uh, I've got it at high speed at the moment. Now, you might be wondering, well, we don't really just want to measure gene, but um, this, this has a serious application. So we've built, at our university, we've built a smart house, and we've got the students to put together Raspberry Pis with the sensors and dot them all over the smart house, powered off USB, you just drop the device in, and, um, and then they're fed back, back to a central server. And we're correlating it with external temperature, external air quality, uh, quality in different rooms and all the rest of it. But you'll notice this is a portable solution, so we can carry this around. I took this on holiday uh, to a nice little cottage in the Cotswolds. Shall I hold that again? That's right. And uh, uh, in this cottage, uh, it were, being in a little village, it had an oil-fired boiler which heated the hot water. So we have stored hot water systems. So it came on every morning, heated the hot water that you were going to use for the rest of the day, and then on demand it would kick in and run the hot water again. 
Uh, it also did the central heating. The thing with these things, any, anybody got oil powered? Yeah. Does it always smell? No. Yeah. <laughs> yes, no, my yes. Uh, my sister has it. Uh, she lives in a little village. This holiday cottage, um, it, it smelled as soon as you opened the door. So, um, so I thought, well, just as a, you know, I'd finished the software during my holiday, which is what we all do, isn't it? Um, and so I, I thought, well, I'll leave it while we go out. And actually, the Prime ran this for about for f for four hours, and the battery did not change. So it's it's quite efficient, and that was with ten seconds sampling. And on, uh, when I got back, I looked at the um, uh, what it what it said. So it came out with a particular set of measurements, and I then thought, well, what I'll do is. Um, our bedroom is upstairs and at the other side of the house. So I will put, put it, uh, uh, and we had our window open all of the time. Mm. So I thought I'll put it in our bedroom just to compare and see how bad the boiler room is and the kitchen compared to the bedroom. So what do we think? How, how much worse do we think, relatively speaking, how much worse do we think it was? 50, 50%? Yeah, something like that. Ooh. Hey, any more offers? 50%? No, no, in the middle of the country. So actually, actually it was 200% worse in our bedroom. And you might be wondering, well, what on earth is going on? And I spoke to my colleagues about this, and, and what it is, is soft furnishings. It's bedding, it's carpet, the, uh, it's paint on the walls. Um, and so we are pollute. you know, we, we think our, our houses are clean because we can't smell anything usually in our bedrooms, but you go in the boiler room and you can smell the oil. So this came as a complete surprise that actually the, air, the indoor air quality in, a, in, a, in what you think is a clean room can be worse than one where, that you go into and you smell it and you think that's a really horrible smelly room, it must be doing a lot of, lot of harm. Now I'm not saying that the oil isn't doing us harm, but it was an interesting experiment. So let's see if we get back to... Oh, uh, one more thing. Uh, so I'm a lecturer at a university and let me see if I can do this. Lecturers, we, we like to use marker pens. Not on my prime. Not on your prime. So if you look at gas, res gas resistance, it's fallen off a cliff, and that's one pen being open. Okay, I'm holding it quite close. Yeah? That's the air quality. Yeah, the gas resistance. That's one. So bottom right, right corner. Bottom, bottom right corner, so over here, look. Yeah. Yeah, can, can, you, can you see that just here? It's, it's dropped off and it's recalibrating. So it went from auto scaling 315k ohms gas resistance and it's, got, it's dropped down to now to about 49. So it's really made a, a really major impact. And if I pull it away, and we waft it a bit. <laughs> Hopefully, you can see it coming back up. Yeah, you can just about make out the green coming up. So it's quite a sensitive thing. Um, and like I say, if I now hit escape on this, sorry, I've got to wait for it to recognize my key press. Oops, and the prime conveniently turns itself off. But I've got a matrix of all of the parameters. So in there we've got uh, the time stamp and the temperature, the pressure, hu humidity, uh, gas resistance, and all the rest of it. Uh, and if I, I can, like I say, I can take that and I can go back and plot it later on, or I can transfer it to the PC, or I can manipulate it in the spreadsheet app. So flushed with success that I've actually managed to get after a year of mucking about with this sensor. Uh, to have something that's realistic, and I've got a portable solution here that I can carry about into different rooms. I thought, what will I do next? Well, to get to this point, 
It's about 1,100 lines of code in PPL. I have not even vaguely attempted to do this in Python. Um, and uh, my daughter was very interested in time of flight LED laser sensors. And I thought, that'll be cool. Uh, we were in the Raspberry Pi shop in Cambridge, so we bought a load of those because, you know, that'll give us a distance to an obstruction. Yeah, one measurement, easy. The manual is bigger than the one for the temperature, pressure, humidity, and air quality sensor. Um, and it's reading many, many configuration parameters out. And then it's manipulating matrices, deciding what pixels in the sensor are dead, uh, reapplying it, and, and all sorts of stuff. So um, what I learned from that is read the sensor manual before you fork out your code, uh, your, your cache, rather. Sorry. So. Um, Read the, read the API, read the sample code and the manuals before buying the next sensor. So I went in search of what else I could use. Uh, so, analog devices do another little chip. It's a three-axis accelerometer. It's a digital electromechanical accelerometer. So basically there is a weight in there uh, that measures uh, acceleration. And you can configure it uh, to measure in ranges of 2 up to 16 G. It has other features. I've not used these yet. So it will measure, uh, and it's application. So again, this is a little three by five millimeter chip, but it will measure tap, double tap. It will measure, have I, is it in motion? Have I picked it up? Things like that. And you can have interrupts coming off those. Now the Prime doesn't handle interrupts, so I didn't bother trying to do that. But the applications include, for example, putting the chip inside a laptop with a spinning disc, although we don't tend not to have spinning discs nowadays, and it could sense that it is accelerating very quickly downwards and it could park the hard drive before it hits the floor. So it's got applications like that. It's also got applications in gaming, pointing devices, uh, and so on. So again, an inexpensive component on an evaluation board, $6 in the, U in, in the US, about seven uh, five pounds in the UK. 37 page manual uh, and a 35 page data sheet but I only actually wrote 12 new lines of code to, to implement this so now we have we'll switch do we yeah oh, okay so again we, we connected prime to the EV one board four wires just the same again we've got the plus the ground the data and the clock no jumper sensors on the boards, and these are bus, this is a bus, and each device answers to a particular address on the bus. So if I, I, I can connect that at the same time as my temperature and pressure and humidity sensor. Uh, so, so this time we've got the little red, red sensor at the bottom here, this is our accelerometer. And so you might just be able to see, can we see there? We've got some numbers coming up, uh, coming off the accelerometer, but let's, that's a bit messy to read. So instead, let's go this one. So, so if I tilt the prime, mm -hmm. it's now, my trace is, is showing how it's accelerating, yeah? Which is quite cool, isn't it? Yeah, so I thought, wow, what can we do with that? Oh, uh, we'll, um, I know, we'll take the car out and see how fast we can go around the local roundabout. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but it's got other applications. Um, so, I built a tilt library. Um, I, I, I'm getting good at this software engineering business. I've only been doing it, I don't know, 40 years. Uh, I've nearly got the hang of it. So, uh, I decided at this point, rather than a monolithic application, I would have a tilt library. So, in the tilt library, I have an, an, in, an init function. Uh, real software engineers look away now, but there's a global flag called tilt enabled. 
So uh, the, the library makes sure that there is an FT260 connected and the accelerometer is connected, sets the tilt enabled flag, and then call tilt read and it returns an X, Y, and Z uh, in the di direction uh, ranging from minus one to plus one. And then I've got some, uh, some convenience functions, so I added invert for the X, Y, and Z measurements if I found that I put it in the case upside down or something like that. Uh, so it's easy to add to any program where tilt sensing might be useful. But it's not terribly useful when it's on a board like this. It's okay, but it's not, it's not great. So my daughter, being a bit of a whiz on um, design, came up with the new HP Prime case. So this has sticking out of the top. Shall we go back? So it's a bit messy. Look, HP design. Uh, it, ha it has the micro USB cable. Okay, I'm, I need to source better cables. I decided to keep the, pres uh, the temperature, uh, pressure, humidity, air quality sensor hanging out top because I thought you would more likely want it outside of the case rather than inside the case. But the tilt sensor is inside the case. We have, we have version two, which is a nice case. Yeah, not, not bad. That was printed on the university's 150,000 pound 3D printer. <laughs> it, it, it cost me 40 pounds for the, for the materials. <laughs> Um, so, uh, we need to decide if that's a, a, a goer or not, but what we now have is my most proud achievement is I, I got a Get It uh, star on Eric's site for my uh, outlook, uh, Outrun game. So, you seen this? Yeah? Um, okay. The thing with this is, is that if I unplug the device, if I plug the device in, Yeah, you're really a nerd. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It, needs, it does need music, so I found, I found a digital to analog converter um, over for I2C. Uh, there, there are other projects that other people have done on the museum site, so I think I can possibly add an SD card reader to this. Uh, I can, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a standard for I2C connectors called Grove or Seed or something like that, so I'm thinking about putting uh, a cover on the back of the case uh, and having it so that you can plug these in uh, as, as, a, as a cheap sensor. And then uh, what I'm going to do, are we happy with that? Do you want to play? So um, I, I, the original racer game, if you were on the, call, the conference that we did online a couple of years ago, I said uh, you know, I wanted to use the power of the G2. Uh, I finally got around to doing it. Um, you'll notice that the draw depth on here is deeper. So if you run the original racer game, you only get half the number of stripes going off into the distance and half the depth of, of road, so you can see it better. The, if you use the keyboard, then it, the, it moves, the car turns by a set amount every key press. With the, sen the tilt sensor, it's proportional to, you, to the tilt. Um, so tilt it, there we go. Power of G2 compels you. That is it. So, uh, there we go, that's it. Uh, FT2, uh, FT260 evaluation board plus its I2C sensors. Just, be, just remember if you're tempted to go down this route uh, and maybe help me with writing device drivers, because that's basically what we're doing. We're writing PPL that will talk the right protocol to the device. It is dead simple to wire up. Uh, you need an HP Prime G2 with recent firmware uh, unlike some of the solutions that are being proposed on the museum site, you don't need an Arduino to have been programmed to connect to the, H to the Prime beforehand. You're just programming it on the Prime. So I think that's an advantage. Uh, and I will open source the software 
so that anybody can pick it up and hopefully add other sensors to the library. Okay, that's it. I will leave it to you. Thank you.